Would you turn to First Thessalonians chapter five? You know, we started talking about um, healings and so forth and whatever, and the Lord just put on my heart before we can really go into a lot of details. We need to understand what holistic healing is. And we're going to talk about holistic healing. Holistic healing means heal the whole thing, you know. <laughs> we, you know, so many times we try and go in one area when there's another area that really needs the healing. Amen. You know, we have a tendency to try and cast out flesh. <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so you know we need to have the discernment of what what's really happening and, and what area of our life needs healing amen praise God so one of the things we need to do is at least define what holistic healing is begins with an H 1st Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 8 but let us who are of the day be sober putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to attain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. Therefore comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. And we urge you, brethren... To recognize labor where? Among. Among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. And to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourself. Peace among yourselves. Now go to verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's talking about holistic healing. He said that your spirit, soul, and body be blameless. So we understand here that what it, the representation of spirit, soul, and body, number one is we know that we're made of three parts, aren't we? Amen. Spirit, soul, and body. In fact, we know that in the Garden of Eden... Their spirit, soul, and body were all one. It was one. In fact, uh, the life in the flesh was in the spirit. But of course, after the fall, we know that the life of the flesh is in the blood. Amen. So we see here now, so if there's spirit, soul, and body that need healing, we understand that there's a spiritual realm in our life, right? There's that soulish realm, or what we call the mental realm, and then there's the physical realm which is chemical realm or, you know, a tangible realm. Is everybody with me? So we see that there's spirit, soul, and body healing. In other words, sometimes we get confused of what needs healing. Now, if somebody scratches their leg or whatever, you're not going to cast out the devil. Hello? Now, one of the first things we always want to do is begin to go into the spirit and pray for healing. But, you know, some people, uh, and don't, don't misunderstand me, but some people um, lose their children and die because they're waiting on God to heal them when the Lord has supplied the medication for them right in their own medicine cabinet. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you know, there's a difference when there are people that do not have opportunity to get healed. Not that God can't heal us, as everybody understand it. But I've heard of, um, you know, certain religions that will not accept a blood transfusion and uh, will not accept medication for their children. And they, their children have died because of plain stupidity. You know what it is? No discernment. No discernment of what God wants to do. Because, see, in the spirit you'll know how God wants to heal. And what we're going to do is try every avenue, aren't we? But we're always going to go to the Spirit first. We're going to what we know that our Lord is the deliverer and the healer. Amen? But if, he do, if it doesn't happen that way, let me tell you something. 
I'll pray for my headache. If it don't go away, I'm in the medicine cabinet getting myself an aspirin. I'm not waiting. I'm getting it. And then why not be comfortable while I'm waiting for the complete healing? You know? I mean, you know, that discernment. No, I'm going to stay in the pain. I'm waiting on God. Go ahead. Go ahead. You can do all the suffering you want. I'll wait on God and feel a little bit better, you know? But I mean, this is what we need to have discernment. Does everybody understand it? Not, and, and, you know, the devil likes to utilize, well, man, you don't have no faith then. You ain't got no faith. I mean, the person's rolling around with a tremendous headache or whatever it is. You know, there's been times, yes, I've, I've busted myself up and I've gone right in and started praying for healing. And there's times when I was instantly healed. And then there are times when I wasn't. So I wasn't going to wait because I knew the Lord had another way for me to get healed. Does everybody got it? Amen. You know, I nearly died waiting one time. <laughs> they finally had to rush me to the hospital. I couldn't wait any longer. <laughs> I said, no, I'm waiting on the Lord. <laughs> and I, was, I remember laying there with an IV in my arm. There was a lady next to me. And I started praying for her. <laughs> but they, I was, they said, you know, I could have gone in, in, in a matter of hours because I had pneumonia or whatever it was, and, and I was waiting on God to heal me. Now, another time prior to that, the Lord had said to me I was going to be afflicted, and I asked him what I was supposed to do, and he said, I'm going to heal you. So I knew he was going to heal me, even when I had 103 temperature. I knew he was going to heal me, but this time I didn't hear that. I was waiting on him to heal me. Then my wife, being a nurse, and I share with her if I couldn't hold one more thing down. This was like the third day. Totally dehydrated with a fever that she could take me to the doctor. Well, <laughs> she took me to the hospital. And they ran me in before everybody. There was, the whole place was filled. And they said, no, man, you're about to die. Get in here. So I didn't understand why the Lord didn't heal me. But then I realized later he was healing me. Hello? Because, see, these bodies are self-healing bodies. God created us for us to walk in good health or self-healing. Or else we'd all have a bunch of funny-looking faces and bodies because we'd have to stitch everything up. You know? Every time we did something, we'd have to sew it up instead of it healing itself. So we must understand that God is a holistic healer. He wants to heal our spirit, our soul, and our body. Amen? Hallelujah. Let's go to Job 32. Now, being a believer, we understand the power of God, the anointing of His healing. But being a believer, we have a tendency, well, we always should go into the Spirit first, shouldn't we? Amen. See, man tries to heal from the outside in. <laughs> but we want, we get our healing from the inside out. And that's what separates a current carnal or the, the natural realm from the realm of the spirit and truth. In verse 8, what does it say? But there is a spirit in man and the breath of the Almighty gives him understanding. Okay? So there is a spirit in me and you. Every one of us is a spirit. Does everybody understand that? And we have a flesh suit. Now, your spirit is what communes with the Holy Spirit. Okay? Your soul is what interprets what the Spirit is saying. And your flesh does the works. Is everybody with me? Your spirit communes with the Holy Spirit who is God. Your soul interprets what the Spirit is saying. That's why we miss so many times because our, our soul is not hearing or it's not interpreting correctly. And our body is what does the works. So now let me give you an example. Your spirit is communing, communing with the Holy Spirit. Does everybody understand that? 
Now the Holy Spirit is going to... Did you ever notice that you hear the same voice all the time? I mean, it's basically the same voice. In other words, that voice is that it's in me and you is that one speaker. Sometimes it's a little bit lower. Sometimes it's a little bit louder. But it's still that same familiar voice. What we're used to is what we used to call our conscience. Well, that's the voice of the other side, which we want to know whether, and we must discern whether it's of God or whether it's of darkness. Does everybody understand that? How many times have we heard, don't do that? It seems to be subtle sometimes, you know. <laughs> and the next thing you know, oh man, I shouldn't have done that. I should have listened to myself. No, that was the Spirit of God. Amen. But as your soul get, begins to transform, it begins to understand what that voice is saying. Because we need to be speaking the same language. <laughs> Does everybody understand that? Amen. So what we need to have done is holistic healing to where our spirit is healing, our soul is healing, and our flesh is healing or our physical. So we see that in me and you, we are a spirit, aren't we? Every one of us is a spirit. And our spirit is communicating with the Holy Spirit. Our soul is interpreting what the spirit is saying and then we're going and doing the works by because we're commanding our flesh to go walk here or go do this or do say, or say this even. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Proverbs 20 and verse 27. The spirit of a man is the lamp of the Lord searching all the inner depths of his heart. So we're the lamp of the Lord, aren't we? That's our spirit man. Every one of us has a spirit man. And an unbeliever still has a spirit man, but the problem is it's asleep. <laughs> it's not awakened. Because God said, I'll give you a what? New spirit. Amen? So that's what we call born again, isn't it? Because we get a new spirit. It's like a new spirit representing our spirit has been raised from the dead. <laughs> Not that it wasn't there. It's just been awakened to what? To the truth of the other realm. Amen? Amen. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 6. Remember your Creator before the silver cord is loosed. Wow. That's like the umbilical cord in the spirit. Or the golden bowl is broken and the picture shattered at the fountain. Or the wheel broken at the well. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and a spirit will return to God who gave it. So everyone's spirit is going to return to God, no matter whether they're going to hell or not. Every spirit has to return to God. It's God who tells where that spirit goes. Does everybody understand? Everyone. Then our flesh is going to return to the dust, isn't it? Praise God. <laughs> Amen. James 2. <laughs> Hallelujah. Never have to deal with that flesh again, huh? <laughs> flesh get ye behind me, right? James chapter 2. And verse 26, let's read that. For as the body without the spirit is dead... So faith without works is dead. So you see a connection here between the spirit and the body, don't you? It says, so without the spirit, the body is dead. So we see we need both. We need all three, don't we? All three. And the more operation all three are, and the more upkept they are, the more maintenance, and the more... There is more unity, isn't there? Did you ever notice you got to carry your flesh around a lot? And as you get older, you find that there's more aches and pains and, and so forth. And, you know, but that's okay. <laughs> We're being, re what, renewed day by day, right? <laughs> Even though the hour man is croaking. <laughs> Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. <laughs> hey, we, we shoot right to the truth here, you know. Amen. First Corinthians chapter six. 
In verse 20, For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Wow. So we must understand, because we were bought with a price now, it's no longer our life, is it? So we were bought with a price so where our spirit, our body is God's. We're His. We're owned by Him. Isn't that wonderful? You're sealed by Him. Now, He always makes a way for me and you to be strengthened in spirit, soul, and body. He's always making a way. 2 Corinthians 4. So we're talking about the spirit, man. Amen? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, in verse 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. So we're being renewed day by day on the inward man, aren't we? I mean, that's what it's really all about. But of course, we want to walk in physical healing, don't we? And we want to walk in mental healing, too. Don't we? We want to have a sound mind, don't we? Amen. Amen? So all of these things work together, don't they? Praise God. Hallelujah. Okay, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So we see that the outward man is temporary, isn't he? But the inward man is eternal. But while we're in this temporary state, we certainly want to keep the temporary man uh, up to par. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. So we see that they are connected, aren't they? So God communes with me and you through his spirit, doesn't he? Through the Holy Spirit. And we know that the Holy Spirit searches the deep things of God, doesn't he? The thing is, is now our soul must be able to interpret what the Spirit is saying. And that it must be learned. Um, in this communion, it is essential that as the soul begins to renew and begins to learn the ways of God, you'll find that the communion is a lot more easier. Because so many times we resist what the Spirit is saying. In other words, we may hear what He's saying, but we don't interpret what He's saying. Does anybody understand that? Yeah. In other words, we may hear what He's saying, but we don't, we're not interpreting what He's saying. So we're just still going about, well, okay, I don't know if it was God or not. And then we fall into a circumstance and go, oh, man, that must have been God. You know? <laughs> and then when we find out it was God or something that we did, well, I think it, I don't know, but, well, I'll, I'll go, I'll do it anyways. I believe it's God. And you find out it is God. It's powerful. It's a wonderful revelation knowing that you just communed with God. But the Lord wants us to do this in a constant. You know, in a constant. Why? Because the Spirit tells us things that come to rescue us. Just like I share with you that um, in my communion with the Lord, when the Lord shared with me, I was going to be afflicted. Now, I would try and share that with other people. they say, God doesn't afflict you. Oh, really? You better read the Bible. God doesn't afflict you, but demonic activity does, doesn't it? God allows things to happen to us, doesn't he? Amen. No. And, of course, we bring it upon ourselves. Now, I had a cold at this period of time, and I was sneezing. And I heard the Spirit say to me, you're going to be afflicted. And let me tell you something. I had such peace, I could care less. Do you understand? I mean, when you know it's God, there was no fear, no nothing. I just said, what do you want me to do? And he said, I'm going to heal you. I said, okay. <laughs> Two o'clock in the morning, I was ill. I was very, very, very ill. Like hepatitis, spinal, no, spinal meningitis. Ill. And uh, couldn't walk, couldn't do anything. I mean, I was hurting. But the Lord healed me the next day. By the time my, I'm telling you, by the time they took me to the doctor, I finally gave in because I said, no, I'm not going, no, I'm not going. But my temperature wasn't coming down, this and that and whatever. And 
and, and my wife went to morning prayer, and they were praying for me and whatever, and I was blacking in and out because of my temperature. My head felt like it was a balloon. But I kept seeing my brothers and sisters laying hands on me and praying for me. It was like they were all around me praying. I kept seeing that in the spirit. But I kept blacking in and out, in and out. But I knew the Lord was going to heal me. And one of my brothers came home in Christ, came home from the morning prayer, laid his hand on me and rebuked the spirit of fever. And they carried me to the car because I couldn't dress myself. I had no power. My hands, I mean, I was like a cripple. And uh, they carried me to the car. And they were going to take me to the hospital. I said, no, take me to a local clinic and let me show you. My, but I, I just knew the Lord was going to heal me. By the time the doctor got me, by the time they got me in the room and stuck the thermometer in my mouth, I was totally healed. Praise God. <laughs> and we went out and had breakfast. <laughs> totally healed, gone, everything. Pain gone, bam, everything was gone. Why? Because I knew the Lord was going to heal me. I had a lot of garlic, too, afterwards, praise God. <laughs> I was going to make sure that wasn't coming back. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6 and chapter 12. Or verse 12. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, and against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. So we must understand that the Word tells us we are not fighting flesh and blood. Amen? So when you do get sick, it's an, a possibility that it could be spiritual, demonic. In fact, in true reality, everything is demonic. But it doesn't mean you have a demon. Does anybody understand that? Yes. No. I mean, because we live in a fallen state, don't we? The ruler of this world is demonic. <laughs> so we're living in his place and his atmosphere that's why he's called the prince of power of air right so we're breathing a lot of garbage there are germs in the air but they're they're live organisms aren't they and these things are can affect me and you whatever but all everything sickness and disease and everything is demonic in one way or another or its source has originated from demonic activity Amen. is everybody with me Somewhere along the line of sin, whatever. I mean, because look at what happened. Adam and Eve were perfectly fine until they sinned. Amen. And that sin still stayed, right? Amen. I mean, God forgave them, but they still had to reap. The curse was there, wasn't it? It was brought down the whole line. Does everybody understand that? So we, it doesn't mean, though, you, you can't cast out bacteria. Does everybody understand that? Amen. Now, I'm not saying that we can't lay hands on and, and, and curse it and command it to wither and die and pray for someone's healing or whatever, but sometimes it just doesn't happen that way, does it? But we must first understand that our first source of everything that we're going to go to is always into the Spirit. First source is into the Spirit. We must always look towards spiritual, but it doesn't mean that even though you're looking towards the spiritual that you're to cast out a devil. Because if there's not truth in the individual, the devil is going to come back, isn't it? Amen. So you can't just cast out the devil until there's truth available, right? Amen. Okay. But we must always look. In fact, um, go to First Peter chapter 5. In verse 8. 8 through 10. First Peter chapter 5, verses 8 through 10. Be sober... Be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Now, you've got to understand something. You're, you're right. He's going to try and devour me and you. If he can't kill you with sin, he'll kill you with food. He'll kill you with words. He'll kill you with anything that he can. Does everybody understand that? Okay. It says, resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. So everyone goes through it. Everybody goes through it. Of course, he'd like to tell you you're the only one. <laughs> Why me? 
so he can beat you up more. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory of, by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, now you understand suffered a while. In other words, you're going to go through it, aren't you? He's, but he's going to turn all things to the good to those who love him, right? Amen. Okay, it says now he's going to allow it to what? Perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Now you've got to understand the final result is settle you. Settle you. So that no matter what you're going through, you're going to search out all three areas for holistic healing. Hallelujah. You're going to search out all three areas. If one doesn't work, go to the other. If that doesn't work, go to the other. Does everybody understand that? Amen. Yes, we know that it, everything began because of the fall. Right? Amen. Well, unfortunately, there are, because of the fall and because of sin, in fact, there are manifestations in the flesh, isn't there? Just like someone who is a homosexual or in lesbian relationships. Sometimes you can't tell the man from the man. Sometimes you can't tell a woman from the woman. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because now the outward appearance has taken on that character from the Spirit. Amen. Okay? Why? Because it's demonic. Amen. That person who has that demon in him or her, that presence of that demonic activity has actually began to change the character. So that person looks like a woman or a man and we know that they're not. Wow. Does everybody understand that? Amen. So even in other things, did you ever notice that when um, somebody is involved in a lot of sin, even their character changes, doesn't it? Their outward appearance changes. I mean, you know, when somebody's drinking or drugging, their outward appearance changes, doesn't it? You know, everything changes. Because... What's going on inside is going to affect the outside. Now, you and I don't judge by what someone looks like. We judge by their fruit, don't we? And their fruit is a part of how they act or their behavior. Amen? Hallelujah. In uh, Matthew 12, in verse 43, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes to dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it also be with this wicked generation. So you must understand that demonic activity, these demons, are wanting access back to our body. They'll take, they'll take anything you give them. Anything you and I will give them, they'll take. So there's many areas where they're trying to get access. Their main access to me and you, we talked about this before, is deception. A dark path is known as deception, which allows demonic activity. It doesn't mean that an individual is demon-possessed. Do you understand that? But he allows the demonic activity to affect him, torment him, and even cause sickness upon him or her or whoever. It could be demonic activity. What the demonic activity can do is cause this individual to take so much medication, they end up dying for too much medication. What this demonic activity can do could cause someone to overeat so that they eat so much garbage, they end up dying and getting sick. Does everybody understand that? Hallelujah. <laughs> so we see that these unclean spirits want access back to me and you. And they get access through deception, don't they? In other words, something you don't know. They also have access through when you and I touch unclean things. Does everybody understand that? When we touch unclean things, go to 2 Corinthians 6. So what we want to do is be able to shut all the doors where demonic activity has now no access to us. Mm -hmm. 
2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Now, this is powerful. You know, if we really get into depth of this, it says, come out from among them and be separate. And he tells us why we should be separate. What's the next verse? Do not touch what is unclean. Hello? Do not touch what is unclean. Now, we can touch unclean things not only physically, mentally, and spiritually. And I will what? Receive you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Now, you got to understand what demonic activity do is always want to separate us from sonship or daughter. Amen? And now, go to the next verse. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Hallelujah. So, don't touch unclean things. He's talking about cleanse our flesh and our spirit, isn't he? Now, unclean things. Well, we know that sin is an unclean thing, isn't it? <laughs> we talk about, now we're talking about the spiritual realm, aren't we? Okay? We know that ancestral curses hinder us, don't we? We know that um, ungodly soul ties hinder us. We're talking about spiritual av avenues and areas to us. We know that um, accursed items <laughs> hinder us, don't they? That's an unclean thing. In fact, in some families there's been incest. Think about this, where the offsprings have become disformed. Because of incest. Why? Because now that's the manifestation in the natural, isn't it? From what is happening in the spiritual. But it's caused a genetic change in some sort, hasn't it? That's why when you go to the doctor, the first thing he says is there uh, a history of diabetes or heart disease or whatever in your family. He, what he's doing, is he's going back to find out what's coming down your family line. The thing is, is they're looking in the physical realm instead of getting understanding the truly in the net, in the spiritual realm, which things must be broken. Amen? Amen? So that there can be truly physical healing. We know that um, even in the present condition, there can be sin right now, not just in our past, right? There can be hindrances, spiritual hindrances right now, something we've done or... or um, Something that someone said that has affected us. Our spiritual makeup as an individual will affect our soul and our body. Our spiritual makeup. In other words, where we are in the spirit is going to affect our soul and our body. Now you've got to understand something. The reason why I say this is because when I was baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit, I didn't know the Word of God. Basically, what I knew in relationship and fellowship was yes and no. <laughs> but I knew when it was yes. I mean, there was a communion, you understand, and there, was a, and there was a discussion. I didn't understand the things of God, but I was able to do the things of God. But I knew that when my soul or my thoughts said, why don't you do this, my spirit said no. And when I heard the voice say, do this, and if it was right before God, I heard my spirit say, yes. Amen. Does everybody understand that? Because I didn't know the Word of God, but I knew what yes and no was. And the Bible says, make your yes is yes, and your no is no, and anything else other than that is by the devil, right? <laughs> so there wasn't great communion, I mean, there wasn't a, a great language until, um, and, and just a common language as for... Um, Tell this person. And I knew that there was the Spirit of God because what was happening was it wasn't going to be bad. Does everybody understand that? But as for the Word of God, I couldn't go out and quote scriptures or um, you know, speak word, word for word of the Word of God because I didn't have the Word of God in me, but the Word of God was in me. Amen. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Amen. So he was directing me already, but I didn't know the scriptures. 
But I was all speaking things scripturally, but not word for word. Amen. Amen. Okay. Praise God. Let's go to 3 John, verse 2. So one of the things that as believers, we must always search out the fruit of demonic activity. Does everybody understand that? Amen. And that's the difference between secular, right, and those of us who are believers. But if you just rely on the secular part and ignore the spiritual part, you could be in deep trouble. Does everybody understand that? Amen. That's why reoccurring things sometimes are always reoccurring because sometimes it's spiritual and it's not. But the manifestation is happening in the physical. Amen? Third John, um, verse 2. Is everybody there? 3 John, verse 2. Let's read it together. <laughs> Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Now, that's powerful. That you may be in health as your soul prospers. Wow. That means we better un interpret what God is saying. So as you prosper and you really know what God is saying, it's health to you. It's health to your spirit, your soul, and your body. Amen. Does everybody understand that? Amen. Now look at One of the things that happens is we know that our soul is made of our mind, our emotions, and our will. Amen? Okay. And our thoughts affect our physical area, don't they? Amen. Our thoughts <laughs> affect our emotional attitude. Like Amen. Stress, fear, hatred, worry, even oppression. Our thoughts affect our emotional attitude. It affects our feeling. You, sometimes you say to someone, hey man, how you doing today? Well, I feel like... Well, who told you that? Yeah, but you don't understand. I feel that way. Okay, well, why do you feel that way? Well, I uh, didn't get what I wanted. Well, that's a terrible way to feel that way, isn't it? That's not a good enough excuse. <laughs> you want to feel pain? <laughs> you want to feel sorry for yourself? Amen? So, yes, feelings God gave us. But we better start knowing which ones that are of God and which ones that are not. So we know that thoughts affect our physical because even people who are stressful, physical sicknesses come upon them. In fact, they, they've, they've done studies saying that people who are very stressful usually get more sick. You know? Yeah. Hallelujah. Um, one of the things that also affect us is truth. Or godly knowledge. Now, truth is godly knowledge with understanding. All right? Truth is godly knowledge with understanding. So if our soul doesn't know the truth, it's going to accept whatever it hears. Is everybody with me on this? In other words, when you and I were in a world, we were always looking for a feeling. Whatever it felt like, we did. But we realized it affected us, especially if we were out partying all night. It sure affected our flesh the next day, didn't it? And then we'd say, oh, I'll never do this again. And we went back out and did it. <laughs> you know, we, <laughs> whatever it was, you know. So truth is godly knowledge with understanding. Of course, we want godly knowledge with understanding. Amen. In Hosea 4, 6, what does it say? My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge or actually lack of truth. So without truth, we will not be able to interpret what the Spirit is truly saying. And we'll be deceived. Amen? Even when the Spirit is trying to tell us truth, 
Even when he's trying to tell us truth, you know how many people have been reading the Bible for a long time and they still don't know the truth. You know why? Because they refuse to hear what the Spirit is saying. And what the Spirit is doing is trying to compare, now that the person has the Word in them, he's trying to quicken them to the Word, but they refuse to hear what the Spirit is saying. So that knowledge is not truth to them. And it's a pathway to deception, which is darkness. And it can afflict us, use us, torment us, and have access to us. Okay, so we know that let me give you an example. The word drugs means black magic, witchcraft, and sorcery, doesn't it? You know, and I share this all the time. When you and I would drive by a bar, we'd see the word food and spirits. And they weren't kidding, right? They might as well just erase the word spirits and put demon. You know, and, and in fact, you know, that's why it's dark all the time. And, you know, I mean, if you've ever been in the bars and, they, and, and it's closing and they turn on the lights, nobody wants to see anybody. They all look like demons. <laughs> Everybody looks like a demon in there. That's why. <laughs> oh, look at his eyes. Oh. Man, I've been talking to you all night. Oh, praise God. Anyway. So the word <laughs> drug means black magic, witchcraft, and sorcery. Amen. So we know that it's demonic activity in our life, isn't it? But it's a representation of the pathway of darkness, isn't it? But now the world in its understanding, in, in the secular, they don't call it that, and they're not going to. They don't consider it black magic, witchcraft, and sorcery. They can look at a chemical substance that's affecting people. And they're trying to do all kinds of things to free them. But that's all they do is go from one thing to another. They really don't get freed. Now, they may do it in their own strength for a period of time, but they're miserable. Amen? Okay. So we know that knowledge without truth is still deception. Knowledge without understanding is still deception. Does everybody understand that? Okay. So we see that truth is light, isn't it? And where there is light, it, it reveals darkness. And once darkness is revealed, we have a choice to get rid of it, don't we? Amen? Amen? So, Lizer's deception is what we call darkness. Amen? Praise God. Go to ver, uh, Psalm 43. Psalm 43. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. Am I losing anybody? Is everybody all right? Psalm 43. And verses 1 through 3. Let's read it together. Vindicate me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. And deliver me from the what? Deceitful and unjust men. That's like deception, isn't it? For you are the God of my strength, why do you cast me off? Why do I go mourning because of the what? Oppression of the enemy. Who do you think he's talking about? Amen. Demonic activity. Oh, send out your light and your truth. Wow. Why? Because they're one, aren't they? Let them what? Lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your tabernacle, which will allow relationship and fellowship in the communion, and communion with the Spirit. Is everybody with me? Hallelujah. So we see here that we must have light, we must have truth which brings light. Go to Romans 12. You know, one of the things is, is just like, um, statistically, as a faith-based ministry, as a Christ-centered ministry, as a Christ-head ministry, we know that accursed items affect people tremendously. I mean, that, that's one of the number one open doors of demonic activity in someone's life. But the secular world doesn't see that. In other words, we know through the years of experience involved in rehabilitation, what the world says, 
as with drugs and alcohol that cigarettes is the number one cause of fall of individuals besides pride. But the secular world doesn't understand that or see that because they don't see the spiritual avenue of that area. Amen? So they need to renew their mind with truth, don't they? <laughs> In Romans 12. <laughs> So it's our responsibility to let them know, isn't it? That's why we're doing this tape. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. They're going to get a teaching on holistic healing. <laughs> Praise God. So to all you secular heads out there, Jesus loves you. <laughs> and he wants you now to have a, a head of Christ. <laughs> In Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we see here that there must be a renewing of the mind. Renewing of the mind being, it's a representation of a change. A change. In other words, we're making a choice to change. We need to change our mind. In other words, but we can't change our mind without truth, can we? There's a lot of people that like to change their mind. In fact, there's a lot of people that, take, that like to take their mind right out. But it can be renewed so we can compare what is right and what is wrong. What is of God and what is not of God. Renewing the mind with truth can affect us in the present and even things that have, have been imparted in us from our past. Even as in childhood. There are many people who suffer today because things that have been imparted in them in childhood. Whether it be rejection whether it be abuse, whether it be abandonment, no matter what it may be, our childhood, there are issues in our childhood. And it doesn't mean that it's sin. God has forgiven us of all sin, right? But there's still certain things in our area. People have gone through traumas. There are men who've come back from um, Vietnam that were messed up, weren't they? Messed up. And they're on drugs trying to medicate those areas, but some of them don't know truth and they don't know any other way to go. So we must look at this soulish part where it's involved with the mind. Now some people have physical areas that have been damaged, whatever it may be. But in, in, in reality of in the spirit realm where the voice comes and affects us and we hear this voice and we've been led by this voice for so many years without truth and the renewing of our mind, we'll always stay right to it. And that's what God says. He says, renew your mind. But we must also let the spirit of truth, which is light, have all access in us, in spirit and in soul. Because if we do, it's going to affect our body. Amen? It's going to affect us. Oh, hallelujah. Go to Psalm 19. Psalm 19. Oh, to God be the glory. In verse 7, it says what? The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise and simple. So we see that the converting of the soul is by the word, isn't it? Because why? You're renewing your mind. Why? You're getting truth. Now, you can't remove memory, can you? But you can replace it with truth. <laughs> you can't remove it. It's imparted in us. But we can replace it with truth. And as we are able to hear the voice of God, knowing that He was there during all of our traumas, during all of our rejections, during all of our hurts, all of our abandonments, all of our pains, that he was there guiding us and trying to comfort us, but we didn't even know he was there. Truth begins to bring healing 
and light gets in those areas and it allows the Spirit of the Lord to have access to them because you and I are what allow the Spirit of the Lord to have access to. Some of us don't want to go in those areas. And those are called strongholds. Does everybody got it? And they affect us, don't they? Emotionally and physically. Emotionally and physically. And it eventually affects you spiritually. In Psalm 23... Verse 1 through 3. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside the still water. Sounds like a, 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 a psychiatrist, you know. <laughs> he makes me lie down. <laughs> but he's the Holy Ghost psychiatrist. Amen. Amen. <laughs> He makes me lie down besides still waters and green pastures and, you know, and, and there's a calmness. And it says what? What's the next verse? And he what? Restores my soul. Amen. He leads me in the path of what? Righteousness for his name's sake. So when our soul is being restored, it's being restored in his image and in his likeness, in the mind of Christ, and we begin to walk in an upright path. Hallelujah. Psalm 119. Glory to God. And, one, and verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So we see that we can change this path of darkness and deception by having truth. Because the word is a representation of truth. Now, somebody might have the word but not understand it, then it's not truth. So there's still deception there, isn't there? Amen? Oh, hallelujah. Turn to Proverbs 17. In verse 22, it says, A merry heart does good like medicine. So does God believe in medicine? Amen. Amen. But a broken spirit dries the bones. So a merry heart, the heart represents the character of your spirit, right? So a merry heart, a joyful heart. The Bible says in the presence of God there is joy it says that um you know the joy of the lord is our strength so you know demonic activity doesn't want you to be happy do they you know they want you to be miserable and then your miserable brings a different continence on someone and it can affect you physically can it amen i mean jesus came across these individuals also healed many of them in mark let's go to mark 9 we're just cruising through the night. Mark chapter 9. Hallelujah. Mark chapter 9. Is everybody here? Amen. Praise God. In um, verse 25, when Jesus, is everybody there? When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you to come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him, and he became as one dead. So that many said, he is dead. He got slain in the spirit. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? Now understand something. Jesus just cast out a deaf and dumb spirit. This individual was tormented with a demonic demon. He couldn't function right, could he? I've cast deaf and dumb spirits out of people many times. In fact, anyone can pick one up. They like to surf us and cause problems. But it's our responsibility to keep ourselves clean. 
you know, just because we're believers doesn't mean that you're not going to be attacked. We just read that the spirits want to come back, don't they? Yeah. Well, let me tell you something. They always want to come back. They're looking for a loophole anywhere, anywhere they can. You know, we just did a teaching on walls and so forth. And if we don't allow those walls and take care of them, there's demonic presence there, man, ready and waiting. And those are the ones that are holding the walls up. We just get triggered and we say, go ahead. <laughs> Amen? Oh, hallelujah. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. You know, the Spirit's been having us get into a lot of inner healing in the last few sessions. And He wants us to be healed and free. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. In verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down... Now, arguments means lies. Lies and, and every high thing that exalts itself against the truth of God. Because knowledge is a representation of the truth. Does everybody see that? So the arguments are the lies. So it's casting down lies and every high thing that exalts itself against the truth of God. Because a lie is deception, isn't it? Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And being ready to punish all lies and disobedience when your obedience or truth is fulfilled. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Strongholds are walls, areas of deception that are triggered by a memory that stirred up an emotion, creating or enticing an unruly choice generated by man's free will. <laughs> oh, to God be the glory. You ready? Strongholds are walls. Areas of deception in our life that are triggered by a memory. That stirred up an emotion enticing an unruly choice. Generated by man's free will. Strongholds are walls. Areas of deception in our life that are triggered by a memory that stirred up an emotion enticing an unruly choice generated by man's free will. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. Do I need to repeat that again? Does everybody get it? Oh, hallelujah. Luke chapter 5 and verse 30 something. 31. Is everybody there? Let's read it together. Jesus answered and said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So even Jesus acknowledged the physician, didn't he? Amen. And we're talking about the physical area or the chemical area in our life. 
Go to Luke 10. In fact, Luke was known as the physician. He was, wasn't he? Amen. In Luke 10, in verse 30, Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise a Levite, when he arrived at that place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him, and what did he do? Bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. So what did he use? He used what? A bandage, oil, and wine. The wine was used to kill the infection. Killed everything else, but... Hallelujah. <laughs> Does everybody understand that? So even the Lord accepted physicians, didn't he? In fact, I always believed that um, God allowed physicians for those who were, number one, unbelievers. Number two, to heal his children. And number three, to those who didn't, who were believers but didn't believe in supernatural healing. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. So we see God used bandages, didn't he? Or he believed in it. And he used it as an example. Let's go to Isaiah 1. Hallelujah. Amen. Isaiah 1 and verse 6. Uh, um, verse 5. Why should you be stricken again? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faints. From the sole of the foot even to the head. There is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and purifying sores, putrefying sores. They have not been closed or are bound up or soothed with ointment. So we see that even in this, we see that there was medication, wasn't it? It was ointment and binding things up. But he also spoke about the head or the mind. Amen. Um, in Ezekiel 47. Hallelujah. Ezekiel 47. And now, uh, let's see here. In verse 12. Along the bank, read it with me. Of the river on this side and that will grow all kinds of trees used for food. Their leaves will not wither and their fruit will not fail. They will bear fruit every month because their water flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for medicine. So God created herbs to be used in healing, didn't he? Oh, hallelujah. I'll go to 2 Kings in verse 20. Second Kings, verse 20. Second Kings, verse... I'm sorry, chapter 20. Second Kings, chapter 20. Hallelujah. And verse 1 through 7. In those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Then he turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Lord, saying, Remember now, O Lord, I pray, how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart, and have done what was good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. 
And it happened before Isaiah had gone out into the middle court that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Return and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, Thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer and have seen your tears. Surely I will heal you. On the third day you shall go up to the house of the Lord, and I will add to your days fifteen years. I will deliver you in this city from the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. Then Isaiah said, Take a lump of figs, so that they took and laid it on the boil, and he recovered. Now, wait a minute. The Lord said he was going to heal him. What did he say? He told Isaiah, here, take some lump of figs and heal him. And they laid it on the boil and healed him. Does everybody see that? You know, far be it that we should tell God how he should heal us. <laughs> Amen? Now, we're all, what we do is we wait. We're looking to be healed supernaturally. But in the meantime, you do what you have to do to get healed. Amen. People go get counsel for soulish, for the mind, for the emotions, don't they? Now, it's pretty ridiculous that they send their dogs to a doggy psychologist. They need one. Hello? <laughs> yeah, my dog's at an appointment today. For what? The vet? No, the psychologist. No way. You know, they need one. Thank Definitely, you. they need us. They need that devil cast out of them. Let's just get right to the spirit, you know. And uh, so we see that we get counsel in the, in the soulish. Amen. Does everybody understand it? Through the mind, sort of because it's affecting the, the, the emotions and the will, isn't it? And we also, we know our great physician who is the Lord who can heal us. Amen. But he uses physicians with medication, doesn't he? Amen? Now, like people who are diabetic, they, they, they want to step out in, in faith and say, okay, the Lord, I'm going to accept the Lord is healing me, and they take away their insulin. And the next thing you know, they're doing epileptic motions. You know what? When God heals you, He heals you. Does everybody understand that? In other words, he supplies the seed for the sower, doesn't he? Well, he supplies the healing for the individual. In the meantime, you just continue to claim your healing till you can get off the medication. Amen. Amen? No matter what it may be. Like I said, if I have a headache and I rebuke that headache, I'm not going to wait till the mouth for it to go away. I'm going to take some Advil or something to relieve the headache. And I'm going to thank the Lord for the medication. <laughs> because he brought it to me. So we need to have a balance, don't we? We want to seek out the spiritual first. We're looking for fruits of the spiritual. We're looking for fruits in the soulish area. And we're going to look for the fruits in the physical, in the manifestation of the physical. Because there are people who have been born with defects, haven't they? That doesn't mean that it's demonic, does it? But let me share something with you. Some of those who have been born with defects or have chemical imbalances, either through traumas or something that's affected them, demonic activity will use them because they're no respecter of person. And you can cast the devil out of that individual, but unless that individual gets healed, that spirit's coming back. So what they'll do is they'll medicate the individual to assist in the physical so they can have common sense to do the right thing so that they begin to renew themselves by the Word of God and healing is beginning to take place and they're able to say no to the demonic activity but prior to that they couldn't, could they? Does everybody understand that? Depending on where they're at. Now we know that in the physical... We know that in the spirit, we eat spiritual food and drink spiritual drink, don't we? It sustains our spirit. It renews our soul. It brings healing to our flesh, doesn't it? But in the natural sense, we know that what we eat is what we are. And I shared already that we must have a balance and know the good things to eat. 
Let me give you an example. Things that are white in flour and rice, it's been bleached. Anything that you read on a label that says enriched, it means it's been killed. And they've had to take chemical stuff from the laboratory and enrich it with vitamins that they created from the laboratory. Does everybody understand that? So anytime you read something that says enriched, that ain't good. All the natural vitamins and substances have been taken out and it's been replaced. And it, you can never replace the natural with something from the laboratory. You can get close, but you can't replace it. Does everybody understand that? Amen. Um, MSG, which is monosodium glutamate. People don't read labels. You know what? You and I as believers should know what we're putting in the temple of God. It's our responsibility. Now, the blood of Jesus protects us, doesn't it? But what we invite in and what we allow to happen in our life will not protect us. There are people who are dying that God did not heal. There are people who have lost their healings because they're still going back to the same old thing. People have been healed from cancer and go back to smoking cigarettes. Dumb. You know? Saccharin and NutraSweet, all of those things cause mental problems. People who drink a lot of Diet Coke, man, that's killing us. Sugar is the number one killer. It causes yeast in our body. Yeast eats the immune system. Statistically, they've done a research on people who are in a mental institution and their bodies are enormously high on yeast. Got real quiet in here. <laughs> Certain fats, cooked food, it's known as dead food. My wife and I went out to eat. She says, how was your potato? I said, dead. <laughs> <laughs> she said okay <laughs> we're to maintain a minimum of 50 milligrams of protein a day 50 milligrams color things of fruits and, and you know red fruits and vegetables and so forth uncooked is good for us we want to eat as much live food as we can then you can eat a little dead food now and then, you know. <laughs> then you can eat a pizza every three months or something like that, you know. But we must stay away from even stuff that says all natural. <clears throat> yeah, it's all natural. But if you ever read the ingredients, it's all natural. Yes, there's no preservatives. But if you read the ingredients, it's nothing but a preservative. Such big words, I wouldn't eat big words. <laughs> if I can't pronounce it, I'm not eating it. Hello? Let me share something with you which increases the aging process in our body. Caffeine. Now, there's nothing wrong with having a cup of coffee out of a day or a cup of tea. Sugar. Anything that causes a high increases your, it produces aging. Because then what happens is people come low and they get oppressed and they have troubles, don't they? So we've got to understand what we're putting in this body. You know, people who were used to be on drugs and alcohol will get off. If, if they're, you know, they'll come for a cup of coffee, they'll say, yes, uh, 16 lumps, you know, my coffee or whatever, six lumps or whatever. They're still feeding that, do you understand? People drink a lot of sodas. Believe me, it's going to catch up. It always catch you. you cannot outrun what you sow. Even though you sow in the spirit, you reap life. What you sow in the flesh, you reap what? Corruption. So what we're putting into these bodies is going to affect us someday. You know, my my, my brother, um, you know, they, they always used to harass me because I was vegetarian. You know, I was brought up in an Italian family that ate a bunch of flesh and a lot of pasta. And, and when I became vegetarian, which I was vegetarian for over 20 years, but then I began to eat some flesh, but not red meat. I would eat chicken, and I would eat some turkey, and then I would go back to not eating any of that for a while and switch it, and then I'd go to tofu and whatever. You know, 
but I, I haven't eaten any red meat in over 20 something years. And uh, one of the things that, you know, my brother now, he, he's diabetic. And I know it was from diet. But you got to understand something. Certain things that were brought down the line cause us spiritually to eat certain foods. Does everybody understand that? And we eat these certain foods, and what we're doing is we're feeding that diabetic, whatever it may be, from the ancestors or, or whatever it was. And, and I'm not saying that somebody can't have an accident.